The supply chain is like a marriage, right? I mean, both parties have to have an interest in making it healthy and making it work. There is going to be a change in dynamics in terms of how all these different pieces come together. There's a very short window of time that you need to be able to land in. I think what we're seeing now is a lot of contortions to try and provide the same type of value to the customers without disrupting a traditional business model. If you don't innovate and you don't evolve alongside of your customer, and it's not just the customer today, but the customer of the future, you'll cease to exist. We live in historic times, driven by innovation, but is technology providing real value? And how do we translate that value into our lives, our companies, our network? How do we stay connected without draining vital resources? Are we moving towards efficiency and sustainability? Or are we weakening the network? A connected world is what we strive for. It changes the world we live in every day, every minute, and sometimes every second. It's what makes our lives better. It's the network of the future. The demand for data, faster time to market, and lower costs have traditionally driven the supply chain for manufacturers and service providers. But now these critical factors are multiplying exponentially, driving the supply chain to meet deadlines that we as an industry are still catching up to. So why do we now call the supply chain the value chain? Supply chain really refers to a kind of this linear, extended, sequence of events that gets a product from manufacturer to user, from point A to point B to C, whatever it takes to ultimately get to the point of use. So in the traditional model, you've got a guy that makes a chip, and then that chip um, gets bought by someone that makes the box. Then one of the, the traditional vendors, uh, say a switch vendor, if we're talking about networking gear, will put the software on it and do the, the packaging and put all of the kind of marketing and collateral material around it, and then they will sell that box directly to customers. A value chain involves conversations that may happen between multiple parties in that chain, not just those that happen to be to directly to the left or directly to the right of the, of the individual involved in the conversation. Traditionally, networks were built by single vendors in most cases. Most of the solution was vertically integrated, so the entire solution from the hardware to the software that ran on top of it to then the support and maintenance and such would have come from single vendors. Uh, that's changing. And it was predominantly a model where uh, you were driving as much cost out as possible uh, for a particular point in time. Customer demand for data and new applications pushed the market far beyond the boundaries that the industry was comfortable with. This realization of a faster and more efficient supply chain was the birth of the value chain. What we've seen in the internet era is just a continued growing of expectations for faster, less cost, uh, more efficient and, and more user rich uh, solutions. The supply chain today has certainly become much more complex. The volume of information and data getting into the hands of not just consumers, but to manufacturers and to those in the whole supply chain itself has markedly shaped how we respond to that information in making decisions. The value chain is being driven by applications. One of the major shifts is that until recently, the network had been the end product. Um, dial tone was a product, dial up was a product, broadband was a product. That's changed. Now and moving forward, application delivery, connecting people and work groups to the applications and content that they crave and use is the end game. What's happening today in the marketplace, quite frankly, is that customers are now determining what that deadline is and then driving the supply chain to meet that deadline. So you're forced to actually create better time to market, whether you want to or not. Traditionally, we've gone to the vendors for innovation, right? The next product and the next feature. But now, the consumer, the customer, these are the ones that are doing innovation. These are the ones that are actually pushing the envelope. The value chain is now driven by a market that is demanding more technologies, more applications, and faster time to market that enterprise and suppliers may not be ready for. So the traditional supply chain has been built on a homogenous model, take it or leave it. That has all changed in the value chain. What's different here is what if 
the end product, the expectations of users, are heterogeneous. They're not all the same. In fact, they may not know what additional services on top of that baseline connectivity they want or need today. What if new things become possible or necessary in rapid turn? How do you do that? In a traditional model, that becomes not impossible, but very expensive and very slow. As we look at what happens in a virtualized world, you know, hardware will become more commoditized over time. It'll become more off the shelf um, and, and, and software platforms become more open systems based. Ultimately, it all means much, much faster time to market. And, and what it means is the innovation cycle improves. A traditional service provider provides, you know, L2, L3 services. It'll provide things like hosting. And these are fairly commoditized, low margin businesses. And on the other hand, you have companies like, say, you know, Amazon or Netflix or Google with YouTube that use these commoditized services to provide high value value add services from the edge, these over to the top solutions. So anytime a service provider hosts um, a box from one of these, you know, value added over the top providers, they're basically trading a 4% margin business for a higher margin business as somebody else gets the money. And so there's a real need for the service providers to adapt to this environment so that they themselves can provide value-added services at high margin. One way to do that is to control the technology, to control the software and provide new innovative services, but it requires them to control their own destiny to do that. And I think that's driving a lot of this need for them to horizontalize the supply chain to get different pieces so that they can build their own innovation within it. Proprietary systems designed for vertically integrated technologies were profitable for years. So why would these legacy companies need to change the way they view the supply chain? I think what we're seeing now is a lot of um, contortions to try and provide the same type of value to the customers without disrupting a traditional business model because nobody knows what that means. And I think we're going to actually see large disruption. It's do or die. And uh, the suppliers out there will at least pay lip service, yeah, we'll support the standard and so forth, but will attempt to drive it to their competitive advantage. Quite often you'll see them provide an interface for a new open technology, but oh, it only works uh, with their technology. There is that built-in native resistance to adapting to new technologies, new standards, and, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, if that other alternative is really successful, they're going to have to jump on and figure out how to either ride that new wave uh, to uh, quite simply adapt or risk becoming an obsoleted supplier. So many companies, those that were the bedrock of the economy in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, have suddenly found themselves no longer relevant. If you can't find relevance in what your products and your services deliver to a consumer, you will not have a future, a future that's marked by profits and marked by longevity, and certainly by the ability to be relevant to your consumer. So how do you turn a giant ship very quickly and without disruption? How can an industry that's worked with the same tools for decades suddenly change the way they do business, the way they communicate with others, and the way they meet delivery goals that just a few years ago didn't seem possible? The supply chain's like a marriage, right? I mean, both parties have to have an interest in making it healthy and making it work. And, and if one side or the other doesn't, um, then it won't be effective. When you looked at most of, most of the people that I worked with in the Silicon Valley here, um, you know, they thought of their supply chain as, as, as one of their you know, golden jewels, right? They didn't want to share information. They wanted to make sure that, that, that how they did it was, was specific to their business. They would share information, but share it sparingly. You know, you'd, you'd see companies that would specifically give one set of plans to a supplier because they wanted them to perform to that, whereas they had their own internal sets of plans. When you don't get enough information, it's hard to give a good solution. So if you keep us at arm's length, the way that the traditional model works, then we all struggle to give you something that you can actually earn money on and be productive and that the consumer is happy and you're happy. Change is hard. Um, I mean, you know, these, uh, these large vendors have a certain margin model, they have a certain sales model, um, they have a certain supply model, and changing that is just very difficult. Even just getting the personnel to understand the changes, getting the public markets to understand the shifts in, in margin and revenue. But I think there's actually something else, which is there is still a very large market for the traditional model a very large market. Uh, this is the classic innovator's dilemma, which is any amount of effort not focusing on that large market is leaving money on the table. 
Most companies have uh, taken supply chain more of a execution and transactional relationship with the suppliers and it's evolved to a more of a strategic competitive positioning for companies to be successful in their markets. You need to be able to get to that end user as quickly as possible with products that they want to buy and there's a very short window of time that you need to be able to land in. Now that requires that you swim all the way up the value chain to make sure that you understand kind of where all the pressure points are and can work with the suppliers to try to eliminate or uh, reduce the amount of time it takes to get through each of those gates. The desire, of course, is to, is to reduce the time from concept of a new service or capability through to its ultimate deployment. Uh, we, we, we went through this ourselves internal to Intel, in Intel's own IT department, where we saw through the application of SDN-like technologies, we moved from weeks, months in some cases, to deploy a new service through to you know, days and in some cases hours, just because of the ability to program and manage resources uh, in a much more flexible, much more agile way. That's a pretty significant reduction just in terms of the experience. If somebody has a new idea and they want to deploy a new service, they can quickly develop it and deploy it and just try it out and see if, if it sticks. If it sticks, you refine it and you improve it over a period of time. If it doesn't, then it goes away. That's the way cloud has evolved and they have a very, very rapid pace of innovation and deployment of new applications and services. And that is what we are trying to bring to the communications infrastructure. There's more value than just low cost. There's collaborating across the chain. And I think that that's one of the beginning trends that we're seeing by a large organization. And it's quite eye-opening because it's something that we're not used to. You're used to doing a transaction, not actually go through the process of trying to gather enough information for everyone to benefit and give you a nice solution. And there's much more cost effectiveness in that process. Everybody in the supply chain will have to change. For example, an OEM in the past uh, provided both the hardware as well as the integrated customized software stack that went on top of it. In this new world, we are going to start seeing standard high volume platforms being used as the underlying hardware layer and then the traditional OEMs probably will add more value in the software that goes on top of it. And again, that software also may not be all proprietary software. As we have talked about in the past, um, open source may be a big component of that overall software stack. So there is going to be a change in dynamics Open source in telco networks is something that's completely new. And what are some of the issues that we'll need to deal with there in terms of security, in terms of reliability, in terms of contributions that will come from many, many different parts of the industry, but that need to still adhere to expectations for service levels and for reliability and performance. A more robust communication layer that adds value to the traditional linear supply chain is expected to yield big returns for operators and suppliers. But what exactly does that mean for enterprise companies who still may not see the real value in the value chain? We're seeing, especially large customers like, like carriers, actually instead of buying from traditional switch vendors, they will go to the ODM, the original device manufacturer, or they might even have a conversation directly with the, the guy that's making the chip. And so now we're actually seeing a breakdown of this traditional model where the customer only sees the end product to one where the customer sees um, uh, every parts of the value chain and actually will dictate you know, which pieces go where and how they, how the, how they use them and consume them. If you could pr procure your hardware from one vendor, software from another vendor, and then applications and services that you'd add on top from a, a multitude of vendors. So if you're bringing a service to market and it could be one focused on a specific market segment or a market, market set of usages, um, you could buy from a number of different vendors in how you put that solution together. Uh, that's new, so that changes the, the value chain. It causes a fundamental shift from single vendor reliance to multiple vendor opportunity. If SDN is the path to making our supply chains more efficient, it will encourage a multi-vendor system, whereas the customer is not just talking to one or two vendors, but to multiple vendors to deliver a solution.
along comes SDN and NFE, cloud computing, uh, data analytics. All these technologies can force uh, this traditional proprietary approach in many parts of the operator infrastructure to now become more open, more virtualized, more dynamic, and uh, enabling other suppliers to take advantage of this evolution of the network. What we've seen is we went from an average of about 23 months developing a product and for those suppliers that we got very collaborative with in this uh, value-added model, uh, we were able to reduce the time frame to 12 months. So if you think about that, both sides win because they both get to revenue much faster than they were in a previous process, and it was costing less to get through that entire uh, process. So it used to be we had a 40-year cycle where a product was good. You would expect it to be good for 40 years. And now you're expecting a payback of about 40 months and you're expecting a design cycle of about 40 weeks. That changes things. That means that the more you collaborate end to end with the customer and with the supplier, the better off you are because you can make changes using your existing infrastructure, which is the key. We start to see more and more uh, enabled by web players and over the tops you know, we're having to do things at what we call web speed, which is moving those, those you know, time to market for new, for new uh, business opportunities and business models from, you know, 18 months, 12 months, really to months, weeks, and days. You know, I believe we're going to see the traditional supply model for a long time. I think as you go down market, as the customers get less sophisticated, they want to buy more complete solutions. You know, some bank in Idaho, they don't have the technologists that can take advantage of this. And so I do think that the traditional vendors will continue to sell down market, and up market is where we're going to see the disruption. We have to work in an orderly process. We have to be able to sort through that evolution in a logical manner. And that means we have to be open, we have to be transparent in our communications, and we have to be trusting with each other and, and between uh, the roles of, of customers and suppliers, that trust and transparent communication is paramount. The value chain and those who dictate its success have a responsibility to follow through with their convictions that an open and more collaborative supply chain is the future of our industry. While some may resist this change from what is comfortable and familiar, the relentless drive for new innovations will be too formidable and old conventions will soon be forgotten. Stay tuned for part six of the Network of the Future documentary on the Internet of Things titled Connecting It All. Also stay tuned for Boom Goes the Internet coming soon to TIANow.org.